great privilege in my career of accompanying many wonderful choirs. And, you know, I, I, I hope it doesn't get repetitious, but accompanying a cathedral choir is a very um, pr is a great privilege, and to accompany them in in concert, in, in performance, in liturgy is, is a wonderful privilege. Many of the accompaniments I had to play were, um, you know, difficult, had to be practiced, and then um, had to work ev working every day with the choir. I started, um, when I was 16, I watched. I learned a lot just by watching. Uh, I was in the organ loft at St. Albans Cathedral every day for even so, just watching the assistant organist at the time, Andrew Parnell, and watching him accompany, watching how he breathed with the choir, how he, how he shaped the phrase, how he uh, followed everything that was going on. And uh, that's, that's where I, I picked up a lot of things, and then just experience. And, and uh, I say being married to a singer actually has taught me an awful lot too uh, about the company uh, because I accompany my wife in, in concert and uh, um, in recital work too. And, and I think the rules for accompaniment for a choir are perhaps a little different, they're not very different, but a little different from if you're accompanying an instrumentalist. Um, there, there's, a, there's a degree to which a choir is a more um, unpredictable instrument. And, and so there, there are some things which I, I can uh, point out. Um, and I've worked with many, many conductors uh, and many different styles. And I think there are some things which I've picked up over the, over the years which, which apply to all of them. Because uh, everyone has their own, their own ways of doing things. The accompanist is often an, an under-regarded uh, profession. And, uh, it's, it's a really, really vital one. And we, we often, you know, if, if you say you're an accompanist of a choir, it's as, almost as though you're a second-class citizen in, in some people's eyes. And uh, there are some, some very important skills which are accomplished in that. So, I, um, first of all, I like to collaborate with the conductor. And I think that's a very important part. Uh, before you even play a note, I think it's very important that an accompanist and conductor collaborate and are on the same page. I was trying to discuss a piece with the conductor. I try and get the markings early. I try and get particularly breathing points early, uh, see where he's going to pull back, change the tempo, uh, and all sorts of things like that. Um, and then, uh, as I get used to the way the conductor works during rehearsal, my attention is, is normally pretty focused. And I think because I'm a choir trainer myself, I, um, I, I can somehow read the mind of the per person I'm working with. So if the conductor will stop at a point, rehearse a point, I already know where he's going to go back to. Because the chances are, it's if I was taking the rehearsal, I'd go back there myself. And that, I think, is a really important skill which isn't emphasized enough for a company. And I've suffered at the hand of accompanists myself. I tend to actually accompany my own rehearsals. I sit at the piano and will accompany the rehearsal because I'm, I feel much more in control that way. Uh, I don't have to say, oh, by the way, page five. Yes, uh, page five. Uh, it's a really appreciated skill for a conductor if an accompanist can immediately just go to the point where he wants to go. And if you're, if you're on the ball enough, uh, that is, you're, one is able to, to predict where, where the conductor's going to go. And I think that's, that's a really, really important thing. Um, I think rather than just talk for a while, let me look, let's look and see some of the problems that arise in an actual piece of music. I'm sure many of you know this John Rutter piece, and I've just given you the first page. The Lord bless you and keep you. Um, how, many people don't, how many people know this or don't? How many people know this? Does, do we all know this? I've sung it. You've sung it, yeah. It's, a, um, it's one of John Rutter's greatest hits. And um, he, he's, I'm sure he's made a lot of money off of this. Um, let, let just sing it. Let's just sing it through, shall we? Let's see what we've got. Just sing the first verse so we won't go beyond the, beyond the line. 
Um, so, what are the what can you see are the are the difficulties that the company is going to have? Because I've played this piece several times, I've also conducted it several times, and this is a particularly challenging compliment, I think. It looks doesn't look challenging, apart from the fact it's in G flat major. C flat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. right. When you're in a difficult key and I keep throwing accidentals at you, that's what you're yeah. Doing. Yes. So the first thing is to be very familiar with the notes. You, as an accompanist, you need to know that you need to know the score better than the uh, better than the conductor almost, and because there's going to be so uh, so many other things being rehearsed, uh, and a piece like this, which has the awkwardness of a key that isn't always familiar um, and needs a little bit of thinking, is, is one that one need to know. So real familiarity with the score through personal practice is, is an essential, I think, absolutely essential. And that obviously is everything else. There are obviously questions of other questions of preparation, and I'm talking particularly today about accompaniment on the organ. Um, How many people write your hand legato? Yeah, exactly. That when you're changing the left hand legato is more difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's this, this, I picked this piece very deliberately because this strikes me as having, having all sorts of issues about it um, that we need to consider. It's really very pianistic writing mm -hmm. and, and um, it's not really an organ writing at all. And if you're not careful, this right hand figure, if you just play it exactly, can be very sort of harsh and, and spiky, particularly in a dry acoustic. I mean, we don't have too dry an acoustic here. But uh, if you're in a dry acoustic, that can be very spiky and not very beautiful. So, it's, it's and as you say, the left hand has that, that cording as well, which, which really is, 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 the, is the key to the harmony in, in the piece. And has little moments where you, you need to, in like in the last measure of the second line, for example, that little passing note between the... Just needs to be very controlled. So that's, that's, that's something we really do need to consider, is how you're going to create a sense of a, an idiomatic organ accompaniment with something that's not necessarily idiomatically written for the organ. And we'll talk about more about that when we talk about the Alleluia Chorus in a few, a few minutes. Um, I think in this piece you almost need to play, uh, you need to almost hold those notes down in the right hand. So, That's how I would approach it. It's very, very, it's much more, um, it's not cloying is the wrong word. It, it's much more a web of sound underneath rather than hearing that. Dum, dum, dum. On the other hand, that figure does give you a real sense of pulse and rhythm. So you've got to create the balance. Because if you just hear that, you have no idea on the speed of this piece. And the, the, first, two, the first seven beats to this piece are absolutely critical. Um, in, in establishing tempo and everything else. So somewhere in there's got to be a ballad. So I, what I do, just for the record, is I separate, the, I don't separate, but I play the first two notes as writ, and I hold that chord on. So I'm playing that. Okay, and it just creates that legato that goes with the left hand. Uh, registration is a really, really important, is a really important thing. And probably in, in my time as a cathedral musician, that was where I spent most of my practice time, was on registration, getting the right sound. If you, if you know the choir you're working with, that's much easier than if you don't know the choir. It's very tricky. Um, I occasionally get asked to play for, for choirs um, that I don't know. And you go to an organ and you don't know how loud they're gonna be. Um, what the conductor is necessarily going to want in terms of in terms of style, and so working on registration, having some idea of what the composer is needing, uh, what he's sometimes the composer will put give you a hint. He'll say eight and four foot here, or eight and two here. Add, take away, and all those all those instructions are really helpful. But work on registration. Get something that sounds fairly seamless. Um, I talked this morning when the class I taught about 
using the um, using the organ as if you're a pianist. I talked about using pistons um, and how I how I organise pistons is rather than have set combinations for hymn verses or things like that. I organise my pistons and it's a very English thing to do this. I organise my pistons in a crescendo. I haven't had time to organise this. But number one, I, I use a string on the swell. Number two, I have, usually add a flute to the string. Number three, I usually put soft eight and four foot flutes, add something else on four, and then gradually build it up. So you've got ready access when you're playing to crescendo and diminuendo just by pressing a button. And it saves you all that having to look over here uh, and, and find a stop. Because particularly on a strange organ, that's, uh, in fact, the first thing I did yesterday at the, the seminary was to set up my piston channel. And so all the pistons on my channel are all set up with a crescendo. So I know exactly when I'm at the, I, I know exactly, I can just press buttons and I have some idea, very quick way to do that. It's a really good way to get control of, of an accompaniment, is to, is to control the dynamics. And it's much nicer to me than using the crescendo pedal, because that, that to me is, is a very, very, um, very dangerous. Uh, I, I don't like crescendo pedals. Um, so, yes, sorry. Crescendo pedal, it goes, um, Well, there are there are some accompaniments in uh, in the in the cathedral repertoire. There's a piece by um, by a composer called Balfour Gardner. And if you really want to listen to an organ accompaniment and how to manage uh, manage an accompaniment, it's a perfect piece to do it. It's it's a it's a piece that starts really quietly and the organ builds up over time with a big crescendo, almost a full organ by the or relatively full organ by the time the choir comes in. And it's always given as a test. I, I've, I've seen it used as a test for auditions where, you know, where they want to see if you can actually make a seamless crescendo. Almost to the point where you're not hearing the stops being added and you just hear them. I mean, Is Isabel did some great things with registration yesterday and you were suddenly aware that extra stops were on but you hadn't heard them come on. Um, and those little, those little tricks, like using the pistons, like, uh, and the swell is the manual you can really control that with, uh, like using the swell pedal. I try and diminuendo shut the swell pedal when I'm adding stops and then open it again. So you're creating that, again, you're not letting people actually hear the clunking that's coming on. If you can do it, it's seamless. And, and that evening hymn by Balfour Gardner is, is a wonderful example of, of, of how an organ accompanist can create a crescendo without you noticing it. Um, uh, I always, for what it's worth while I'm talking about that, I usually am very light on the grate. I use the grate that I would only use an eight foot, or even, perhaps even a four foot if I'm feeling really daring. And I use the swell as my main resource because again, it's controllable and you're not, you're not drowning out. Very thick organ tone Will, will, will muddy a choir, will, will conflict with, with the choir. And with accompaniment, you're not the star of the show. I hate to admit that, but accompaniment, the organist is not the star of the show. And if you are the star of the show, then the, the performance is usually not, not so great. I once had to play cymbals in a, in a local orchestra in St. Albans and played them so loudly that I was apparently the star of the show, according to the review in the local paper the following day. So don't, don't, uh, don't, don't hold, the, hold the scene. So yes, so that's even before we really start learning the piece, looking at the problems that are associated with the writing. And it's not bad writing. I'm not criticizing the writing at all. It's that broken chord figuration. Those of you who are pianists know that the convention for the classical sonata, when you have that sort of figuration, um, that sort of figuration, the convention was that the bottom note was almost held, that they were they were broken chords and you almost held the notes on. So you're not just playing dum 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 dum, you're playing da da da. So you're hearing that harmony. 
And I think if you create that on, on the organ, you're going to be a firm. You're going to give that, give that real sensation. Yes? Don't you think that that's an instinctive thing, though? I do. I actually do. But you'd be amazed how many people see it on the page and play literally what they see. Um, and I think, yeah, I think you're right. It is, it is instinctive. I just Certainly in the piano, that, it's instinctive. I mean, instinctive. that seems to me an obviously yeah. instinctive thing, but maybe it's... It is. I mean, I think on the piano, it's probably more instinctive than it is on the organ. And uh, where you're, you know, you're not necessarily, you see much, you, organists tend to see what they play, because that's how we're taught. I was taught um, to observe every single dot, every single rest. And yeah, I play some Messian, and I was in the, I played it Messian in the competition when I was young. And Gillian Weir, who was one of the adjudicators afterwards in the um, debrief session, this was the St. Albans competition, which is, I think it's just finished in St. Albans. And I was in the final 12, which to me was the achievement. I didn't expect to get through any further. So, um, but afterwards, she took, she took me through a piece of Olivier Messiaen, which is very, very complex music. And, and, has, and Messiaen writes rests of ridiculous lengths. And Gillian, Gillian Weir, Dame Gillian, she now is, had been there tapping. She was obviously sitting at the desk listening to everyone play, tapping the pulse because she told me that I'd miscounted a rest by like a, a 16th, and I'd miscounted this rest by, by a dog. So I know, you know, and my organ teacher, Nicholas Kinston, very, very hot on making sure that notes last the duration they're meant to. And if I held a note on, in, particularly in Bach, he was very, very keen. I, I became very, very, um, very attentive to detail. It's a positive thing, but it also is a negative thing. Do you think that's, though, kind of inherent to the organ, though? I think so. And the, only, the other problem with the organ is that it's the easiest instrument to play on music. And, and um, you know, it's, it, it's a very easy instrument to, to lose a sense of rhythm on. And I'll talk more about that when I'm talking about hymns. But, um, I mean, Sh Stravinsky, one of my favorite quotes about the organ, is Stravinsky who said that the monster never breathes. And he said he didn't like the organ because he said the monster never breathes. And, and we have to give, and that actually will lead into my next point about this piece, we, we, we do have to give a little bit of give and take in the instrument. Uh, you know, we're dealing with a machine, so we don't need to make it sound like a machine. Um, good. So we've, that's all our initial thinking. That's enough, isn't it? That's, that's, uh, that's enough to think about. Now we have to add the singers. And what do singers do that none of the rest of us do when we're playing instruments often time? Singers breathe. Okay. And again, I talk from experience. I've heard this accompaniment played like this. So they sing, the Lord bless you and give you the Lord. In other words, they would take the breath on the tied note of you, but then I would give them a tiny fraction of a second extra. And if you sing, you will know exactly what that is. You will know because it's an instinctive thing. The Lord bless you and give you the Lord make his face to shine upon you. There's another one. Whereas if you're really pushing a singer along, they're not going to have time to take a breath in order to get their full support, to get their lungs full of air. And so it really helps. It really helps either to... I, I spent a lot of my youth playing for singing lessons, which is where I learned, again, where I learned a lot of stuff. It really helps. It really helps if you're almost singing along. I don't like singing along. Um, but in your head, you've got to be with the singer to feel that breathing. I almost try and breathe with the singer when I'm playing this. 
um, because otherwise you're going to rush them. Shine upon, oh, well, shine upon you to shine. They're going to feel very, very rushed, and the, the musical line will suffer. So you just need to be a little bit more flexible with, with how you play those eighth, eighth notes at those breathing points, um, and just listen to the singer and follow. And you can do that without losing the rhythm or the pulse. You can, you can do that. It just, it just needs, it's a very, very subtle thing. It's very hard to explain and very hard to teach. And, and you're right, it's a lot of instinct. And so that's, that is a really good example of, of core accompaniment to me and some of the issues, some of the issues that we have with, with, with the work we do. Um, so I've talked about registration balance. I've talked about breathing with singers. I've talked about um, you know, keeping that sense of rhythm. As an accompanist, you need to keep a very clear sense of rhythm. That if you're following a conductor, that's given to you. And you, you, you need to, again, you need to know the music well enough to see the conductor. There are a couple of skills which um, I think are really valuable in an accompanist, and they can be practiced and taught. And I don't, the, the allegory, of course, it would be a good, a good uh, or the, any of the side choruses would be a good example for us to look at. Um, and that's the ability uh, to pick out a part from the score. Um, and some people have difficulty doing this. To be able to play if an alto and tenor part in a rehearsal is needed to be looked at. If you can just work out how to play the alto and tenor part. Because reading the tenor part down an octave. Um, and there's the great skill of score reading, which I don't think is taught very much. Uh, these days. It's something I got taught and uh, I had to read string quartets with alto clefs and I had to read palestrina motets with C4, C3 and different bass clefs as well. Uh, I couldn't do that anymore but I can read vocal score fairly well, uh, five or six parts even. And that's a really good skill to, to, to make yourself uh, read the vocal parts as opposed to reading the, the reduction. Uh, and I have a couple of hints about that. The, the main thing I was told when I was struggling with it was to read up, to read the bass first and then to read up. And you will find that makes life a lot easier for you. Because uh, we all obviously read this, because I think we're conditioned to read the soprano line first and then we read down. And what happens is you end up missing. If you read up, you actually catch everything. And it's something that's really worth practicing because it's a skill that uh, choral directors really appreciate. And occasionally you'll come across an edition that doesn't have a choral redu a piano reduction. And uh, it's, it's really a great help if you can score it. That's, that's a, a skill which I think is, um, is, is really, really valuable. Um, do, you, do you have to do keyboard skills as part of your training? Um. We did score reading, but yeah. if my undergrad, yeah. Yeah, so score and reading. And I hated it. It was awful. <laughs> yeah, I, I did too. Uh, score reading transposition. Um, that's another skill which an accompanist is occasionally called on to do. Hopefully, you have a conductor who gives you notice if you want to put a piece down. Uh, when I was cathedral assistant, the beginning of the service was always a set of responses, a hymn, and then the psalm. And they were quite often we tried to make the keys so they were compatible with one another. So you didn't go from E major to E flat, for example, in a, in a single, in a, in a sudden jump. And I would quite often be sidled up to during the playing of a hymn and said, we need to put the psalm down a step. And so very quickly you'd be, <clears throat> you learn how to do it when you're put in that pressure situation. Your organ didn't have a transposer. Didn't have a transposer, no. And I refused to use a transposer. And you know, again, being with Christine, my wife, she she will quite often say, "Can we do that down? Or can we do that up?" And and that's that's a that's a, a, a good skill to have too. And there's something to practice. It really helps if you if you're very good with keys and key relationships. And that's where basics like scales and arpeggios really prove their worth. Um, because if you're aware of a key and the chords within a key, a really good exercise I recommend is, is how to harmonize in a major scale. If you can harmonize a major scale, um, 
it, it, it's useful for choral warm-ups as well. Inopportune moments. Um, several times. One time when the organ gave up on me during the covenant, I played an organ that was on its last legs, and the, the, the wind collapsed during the covenant of the peace, and the choir had to carry on in the covenant. And you can, you're just helpless. Um, and I say, occasionally you will, you will uh, press a piston that's the wrong one. Get a sudden burst of sound and or black. yeah, or that. <laughs> uh, again, something I'll talk about with hymns, but um, the text is in, the text of an anthem. Sometimes gives you clues as to what you can what you can do. There are, there are witty organists all over the world who, who will try and do interesting effects. Uh, in the Anglican tradition, we, we play we have chanted psalms and we sing chants to Anglican chant. And often those psalms have, the psalms have some really weird verses. I don't know if you've read, or you, you've all read them all, but they have some really strange things. There's one, his words were softer than butter, yet sweeter than oil. He had honey in his heart, and something like that. I can't remember exactly what the verse is. It's uh, in, the trans, in the prayer book translation, that's what it is. And try, try and illustrate that. But anything later go down to the sea and ships, there is that Leviathan. There are really good opportunities to, to think. One of the great heroes of my childhood was George Guest, who was organist at St. John's College, Cambridge. And Dr. Guest, uh, I was very privileged during my time at Cambridge to be allowed into the organ loft at St. John's to watch him play psalms. And he was just a master at all of those things. There were lots of little in jokes and, and everything else. But, uh, that's, I wouldn't recommend doing that necessarily in John Rutter, but it, it's, um, you know, there are little effects you can use to take, and we'll talk about it. Now, let's look at the Alleluia Chorus, because I t entitled this session, How Do I Play the Alleluia Chorus? And I wasn't sure when I came what edition we would have uh, available to us. We have Watkins Shore edition, which, in my opinion, is, is, is the best, is one of the best, the one of the best out there. Watkin Shaw was a great, great scholar, and um, actually this takes away some of, my, some of my points because he did simplify this accompaniment considerably. But as accompanists, you quite often get, particularly on the organ, um, an oratorio chorus. I'm thinking of something like He Watching Over Israel by Mendelssohn is a good example. It's, it's fairly common, I think, in a lot of churches. You know, he watching over Israel, slumbers not, as you can tell I'm not singing, slumbers not nor sleeps from Elijah. And that has a very arpeggiated accompaniment, which is, is it's clearly an orchestral reduction. And so what we're dealing with with music like this is an orchestral reduction. And, and your task as an accompanist is to create an arrangement of an arrangement, as it were. And, uh, so this, I, I picked the Alleluia Chorus because it's a piece we all know. Um, it also seems appropriate, being as we now have a future Prince George on our hands. If you don't know, they've named him George. Um, so he's going to be King George, which uh, has resonances, of course, with this country. Be another King George for us all. Um, but let's look at the accompaniment quickly. It's it's not necessarily written for the organ, although he does write, uh, he does give an indication of pedaling. Um, 
It's fairly complex. It can be played on manuals, or it can be played on pedals. Um, there are some things at the bottom line, for example, where the pedals are coming very high. If you're using pedals in that top D, your feet are going to be fairly high. It gets fairly complicated. The um, orchestral transcription includes all those, all those 16th notes. Um, it gives indication about trumpets to tell you that's what's playing it in the orchestra. Uh, also gives you a hand uh, with some accompaniment. If you look at the accompaniment on page 173, and I'll play this in a minute, you'll see all those little da 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 it, and I think it's, a, it's very important to, for you to listen. If you don't know a piece, we all know this one. But if you don't know a piece, it's very important to listen to the version, listen to a recording of it with the orchestra, so that you can hear which are the important themes, which, what the composer wanted us to hear. Uh, and there are several times when the Brahms Requiem is a good piece in mind. If I ever played. How lovely are thy dwellings? It was, it's, it's a real revelation to hear um, you know, the, um, It's a really real revelation to hear in the middle section he starts and then he starts again. And if you don't listen to the piece, you'll just hear this. What you, don't, what you hear in the recording is, two in, is one instrument doing this. Or whatever it is. And then you hear the other instrument coming on top. So it's, it's two instruments. And it's really nice to be able to bring that out to let people think, well, Brahms actually wrote this as, a, as an echo or an imitation of, of the melody. So keep that first melody going. And there are little places like that which I think listening to a piece really tells you. Um, so, I'm, I'm fairly, again, it depends on your acoustic, it depends on your instrument, it depends on your conductor. And, but having said that, I think there are things here which you can make life fairly easy for yourself, of just even playing the basic chord structure. Um, because, again, as I said, the accompanist is not the, is not the king, is not the king or the queen here. So, we're not really listening for the accompaniment, we're listening for the singing. The text really needs to, the text and the choir are what you need to highlight and you need to help them uh, help them by through your accompaniment. So if we played this, if we played this as written, um, okay. If we played this as written, then I'm gonna play it fairly lightly here. That's a very different skill and, and art because you really are just filling in spaces. And, and you will, I mean, where, where, and what, in the Watkins Shaw edition, where he's written the little notes, they're often what, what is missing from the orchestral part. And so those little notes are really helpful for a continuo. I quite often have played continuo in performances of this, and, and rather than use the orchestral score, which they provide me, I, tend, I pr much prefer reading and making up my own part from a vocal score. I tend to find I feel more in control of it. And particularly with solo work and everything else I've got, I know my little chords and my little tricks that I can use. But continuo playing is a whole, is a whole other talk. Um, and it's quite a, quite, a, quite a skill to 
Um, but I think what's, what's important in this introduction, I do think that base movement is, is important because obviously you're providing the rhythm. And I think that the, um, the, the melody is important. I don't think, for example, you need to play the octave in the second measure. I think you can just play a, a much thinner chord. Um, and I would just thin that out a bit. Again, thick, thick chords. If you're playing chords with too many notes, the organ's going to make it sound very thin. So you need to thin things out. Um, I wouldn't necessarily, in the first, in the second measure, in the first measure of the second line, I'm not necessarily going to jump my hand up to that top D. I'm just going to play a G major chord there. And I could play the G major chord in the same register of tessitura as I'm playing the first part of that phrase. So instead of having to jump up, uh, So don't, what I'm saying to you is, is don't be afraid to um, depart from the rhythm text. Um, particularly, say, particularly in this style of music where you, you're creating a rhythm for the rhythm. And um, I, I wouldn't necessarily, unless you've got really good wrists or really, a content, or really happy with your staccato techniques, um, I wouldn't necessarily be worried about all the 16th notes on the bottom. So it's little things like that which, you know, I could talk about every single example, but I think you're getting the picture as to, as to the techniques I would, I would recommend here. Top of 172, that unison is, 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 a, is a nice relaxing place for an accompanist. You can get your breath back there. Um, and then really what you're doing for the next two measures is hovering around between a D major chord and an A major chord. And in my book, any combination of notes that make a D major chord and an A major chord are accepted. Would you try to pull out the trumpet when the trumpet? I would probably have it drawn. If I, if I have an organ that's big enough, I would probably have my trumpet on a separate manual. If, um, if um, I just had a small two manual organ, I probably wouldn't worry about the trumpet. I may just add a mixture or something at that point, just to create that brightness. But I don't think... Again, it's what, I was, it's what I was saying about those of you who were here this morning. Um, the, you know, the organ is not there to imitate the orchestra. The organ's there to be an organ. You're not trying to recreate an orchestral sound, necessarily. In other words, you, the, you're not necessarily trying to sound like a brass section. Um, you know, let the organ be the organ. Um, and, and, but if you've got the trumpet, and you've got the facility to do it, yes, then, then bring that in. Trumpet stops, in my opinion, are, um, they're like bad dinner guests. They can outstay their welcome. And so you don't need to use it too much. I learned that lesson very, I learned that lesson very clearly in my second week as a cathedral organist. I was playing, uh, I don't think it was this piece, it was a piece that I thought I was very clever using the trumpet for several things. And the conductor, because the organ was near to the choir, conductor during the rehearsal, it, fortunately it wasn't during the service, but during the rehearsal he left the choir to sing, walked over and just slammed the trumpet shut in front of everybody. So uh, I, learned, I learned then that the trumpet was not to be used at that point. But yeah, I, I use all these effects very sparingly. I'm not a great one for things like Zimbelsterns and things like that. You know, I use them, again, I use a Zimbelstern perhaps twice a year at Christmas and Easter. And that's it. Yeah. So, so all that sort of thing, and I think you can be, just be judicious, just use, the French had a great, 18th century French music, had this wonderful concept, which they referred to as GOUT, G-O-U-T, which is the French word for text. And I think we just, put, and they, ornamentation was always, fairly well codified in that music, but they said the missing ingredient was good, was taste. So use your good taste and your, your musical instincts when, when you're, you're dealing with this. And then I think um, a piece like the Alleluia Chorus becomes perfectly approachable and, and, and perfectly good. 
When you get to page 175, what you're doing is really doubling the chorus parts there. Um, and again, I would, if, you, if, you're not, if you're not comfortable playing all those notes, just put a chord or play on every single beat. I don't think you necessarily need to double everything the singer's doing. Besides which, I find doubling singers is a dangerous thing because you show up, you show up bad tuning. Uh, if you double everything they do. They, they're not always appreciative of it. Um, and then I think the rest of that piece, every, everything that we need to uh, think about is, um, is, is already been covered. Well, actually not true. Um, King of Kings uh, and Lord of Lords, I, again, depending on the instrument, as to whether I would hold those top notes on, I'm talking 176 now, as to whether I would hold those notes on, because Notice at the bottom of, um, if, again, if you listen to the orchestration, the trumpet is, what, is what's playing those notes. But, uh, again, not necessarily wanting to double the sopranos all the time, because that's a, a hard note to maintain. So I would just play the, um, the forevers and not worry about that top note. Um, <coughs> then, when we get to the top of page 179, it starts going a little bit crazy. And again, I think judicious, judicious use of a, 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 a chord every, every quarter note, I nearly said crotchet there, a chord every quarter note um, will suffice to me there without necessarily hearing all that detail. On some organs, those 16 notes aren't going to sound. Um, and on page in the middle of 179, all that, all that figure work. Um, it's a lot of work that doesn't necessarily have a reward. If you're on a really bright instrument such as this, I, may, I would consider it or the, or the instrument in the power hall. But if I was on a, a two manual, um, you know, 1930s instrument that had bad wind, and hadn't been looked at properly, the keys were a little bit suspect, I probably wouldn't worry myself about that. And you know, when it comes down to it, it it's what I what my mother calls horses for courses. It's it's just what you have, what facilities you have. But hopefully that that's given you a few pointers as to, as to how I would approach a piece like that. Um, and and say in the early part we we're talking about some of those some of those basic disciplines which which I think an organist needs to have. Um, organ accompaniment is a very different thing from piano accompaniment because you've got an instrument that's not nearly so responsive. Um, <coughs> legato playing in its place is good, but I said I think it's just important that you you are collaborative, that you know what you know what's happening, that you 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 follow a conductor. You ask a conductor what he wants, and most conductors will tell you. I have a question. Yeah. I think this would apply to a lot of us in this room. We, the type of anthems we play are a lot are similar to what we've been reading. Yes. Uh -huh. Very little classical. They're written for pianos, mm. and a lot of us see the kind of piano and organ in our yes. church. And I am in a, I've been at my job about six months. I'm really at a quandary. What, what do I play on the organ? I don't want to play what the piano's playing. I don't. No. The, the choir parts. Just play the choir. What the choir parts are singing. Yeah. But I don't like that. I can read everything and make up my own, okay? Yeah. And that's what I want to do. Well, I, I, I would suggest that you, you play something that's basically fairly simple, not yeah. too detailed. If the piano is playing with you, let the piano do the, do yeah. the hard work and just be like a continuo player. Yeah. Um, I, think, I don't think the organ necessarily works well with jazzy rhythms. I mean, I've been listening to a lot of those reading sessions and, and some of those pieces I heard at lunchtime with those heavy jazzy beat, yeah, yeah, it doesn't necessarily work well on an organ. I think you, you, um, you know, again, it, it's using, it, it's making, letting the organ be musical. I think the music has to be first, that you make the musical effect. And, and hopefully you will have a piano with you or, or something. If you don't, then pick out what needs to be heard. So I will um, tell him that you said not to play the choir parts on the organ, just, that's so boring. Yeah, it is, and it's not, and I would only do, I, I very rarely, my choir in, in Little Rock, I very rarely will double their parts, if, if I have to. Uh, I mean, if, 
if, if in the rare case they get given a piece at the last minute, which does happen occasionally, and I, I throw something at them and say, oh, by the way, we're doing this, uh, which I usually try to find something they know. But if they're unsure, it, they obviously have the confidence and the comfort. But uh, you know, I do a lot of a cappella work in my choir just to wean them off my reliance on me. Yes. One thing I've done, you all probably know the majesty and glory of your name. Yeah. So when you get to the part that has the, it's all kind of arpeggios with the piano part, just put the chord on one manual and solo out like the top. Yeah. And that, it sounds like you've got like a little obligato instrument. It really adds a lot. Yeah, yeah. playing one line, that's a really good idea. Pedal in a situation like this, or stay off the pedals completely. Uh, if, you, if you've got a good sense of harmony and a sense of what the harmony is, yeah, I would use the pedal because it gives that depth. Um, just gives that depth. And stay, stay off like in, maybe the, anything 16 foot and below? Or just yeah. I, I mean, 16 foot on the pedal I would use because it, 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 it's 16 foot can be heard. Um, it's, it's the stuff in the middle that gets very dense and you're not necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thank you for thank you for bringing that up because a lot, as you say, a lot of that repertoire is, is written more for piano than organ, and, and um, it, it's a case of it's a case of adapting. It. But as, I mean, I think some of the principles in these pieces are the same, and that you can you can do that. And the rutter, I think, is a good example of much more that style, and that's why I put that in. Um, Another piece of music that we have to do every year, and I have to relearn it, is the chorus. Right. <clears throat> and I don't play all those chords. I play 16 notes somehow. I, I simplify it and just chord it. Huh. A, a, a rolling chord and mm -hmm. the melody rolling. Exactly. The eighth note there, it's, it's not a clump. It's no, a da -da. that's right. No, I think, as I said, it, 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 all I'm looking for is something that's musical. And, uh, not too dense and not too thick. I mean, this, this can sound... <laughs> No, I've, as I say, it's, it's been a big part, of, accompaniment's been a big part of my life. I still operate as an accompanist in, in, for, a, for the Arkansas Chamber Singers, they're called. I, I, work, I work with them as their accompanist, and I find it very refreshing to be able to go to a choir rehearsal and not have any concern for it to be someone else's problem. Um, you know, if the sopranos aren't singing in tune, hey, it's not my problem. <laughs> uh, I'm just the accompanist. But I would occasionally you know, accent a note for them or something. When you do the company, uh, like when the wife is singing, mm -hmm. is that on the organ? Yes, we do. We do some. Uh, we do organ and soprano work. Um, is it mainly? Do, mainly on the organ. We mainly we mainly work in churches, and uh, you know, she's she's uh, say she's she's trying to break. She's trying to establish herself as a oratorio singer. And a sacred music mm -hmm. um, singer, so that that's where a lot of our recital work is, is focused. Is on churches. And she's, you know, she's she's uh, she's she's getting recognised now by some some orchestras and, and things like that. So uh, she she hopefully be a California singer with Pacific Symphony and Christmas and things like uh, that. You so, said y'all had made a CD. Did you yeah. bring any that we could purchase? Uh, it's on iTunes. <laughs> it's, um, I do have two copies here, but I have them reserved. Um, it, it, you, you can get it on iTunes. Um, there you go. It's called Aura Pro Nobis. Um, and it has, I start, I start the CD with the E flat major prelude and fugue by Bach. Um, which, as you know, was written to frame a collection of organ music, the Clavier uh, Bart wrote the prelude to start with. And then the fugue, which is called the St. Anne, because the melody sounds like the tune to Oh God, Our Help in Ages. And so that's, that's the disc we recorded in Little Rock. It has the P.A. Jesu by Laudate Domini Mozart, I Know My Redeemer Liveth, The Holy City, 
Domine Deus Vivaldi from Gloria, Hail Israel from Elijah, Ave Maria, Schubert, O Divine Redeemer by Cooper. That's what she said. They covers just about everything. It's, say, it's available on iTunes and uh, Amazon. Can I see it? Sorry. Yes, absolutely. Well, I didn't expect to do that. <laughs> <laughs> that better get knocked yeah. off there. <laughs> You just look up Christine Westhoff in the um, in the search engine for iTunes.